Bevy Smith on today. And you probably know Bevy Smith from Bravo's Fashion Queens. And she also has an SXM radio show on Andy Radio called Bevelations. And she has a fantastic new book, Bevelations. And it's lessons from a mother, auntie, and bestie. And I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me, my love. And we also, I want to just talk, there's so much in this book that is so wonderful and such useful information for everybody. I mean, from, from kids starting out and people like you and I that are in our 50s and women, and it is a self-help book. Yeah. So can you kind of just tell me what sparked you to write this book? Um, I was really um, encouraged to write this book by folks that would contact me on social media who wanted to know how I made the transition. You know, I was 38 years old with a very successful career in fashion advertising when I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. And 38 years old, you know, that's usually when you start beginning your prime earning years in your career. And I certainly was making a, a great mid six figure salary and I was flying high and I had a lot of access and it was very fabulous. And I decided that I didn't want that anymore. Now that's a shocking thing to say and, and even more shocking to do. And um, so when I quit my job at Rolling Stone Magazine and I actually went forth with this idea that I want to be in media, that I want to be a TV and a radio personality and I want to be an actor and I want to be a fire eater, I want to be a DJ, a photographer and I wanted to like juggle you know, anything, yeah. everything that I ever wanted to do, I was like, I'm going to pursue it now. So I'm 38 years old and I decided to do that. And by the time I get on social media, I'm actually appearing on TV on a very regular basis. I'm doing E, I'm doing VH1, I'm doing BET, I'm doing all these things. I'm writing for Interview Magazine, Paper Magazine, Glamour, Essence. And people are like, oh my gosh, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, um okay, you want to meet with me so I can tell you how you do it? And people are like, they want to meet, pick your brain. Can we have coffee? I'm like, oh my gosh, well, no. Because if I did that with every single person that wanted to meet with me, I wouldn't really have much to say because I wouldn't be successful. Because that those kind of things are very time consuming. So I decided to write the book, Revelations, Lessons from a Mother, Auntie Bestie, because I wanted to share with people that you can always change your life. I have a, my number one revelation is it gets greater later. And I believe that wholeheartedly in my heart, in my spirit, in my mind. And I believe that for any and everyone, you know, um, I am a black woman from Harlem with two parents um, and my, both from the Jim Crow South um, and my daddy at the height of his uh, work experience made $50,000 a year. And you know, they came from, like I said, Jim Crow South, um, not well educated at all, but they managed to create this wonderful life for their children so that their children could do better than they did. And they succeeded in that. Mm -hmm. But all that to say is, you know, when you look at me, I'm a, a, a curvy woman from Harlem. I'm entering into TV, which is young, very white. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I'm not those things. And it's very thin. And I'm not those things. Mm -hmm. And yet I was able to do it. So people yeah. want to know, how the heck did you do it? And that's how the book idea was born. Right. And I mean, when you read the book, you know how hard that you worked to do this. I mean, it, it is very amazing. And I think, you know, you're, you're saying your number one revelation, it gets greater later. I was like, oh, that is what our listeners are all about on Hot Lessons. We should all be all about that. We should never feel like, oh my gosh, I am X, Y, and Z age. I need to give up on that dream. Or, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that's a silly idea. Oh, mm -hmm. why would I think I could do that? You know, we don't, we should not be speaking negatively against ourselves. Mm -hmm. we let up, there's people in the world that will clamor to tell you why you can't do something. You shouldn't be one of them. That's right. And, and you, you, meant, you talk about that in your book, too. And that's a big goal on Hot Flashes Cold Topics is to change the narrative of what a woman in midlife looks like, which <laughs> with the midlife thing, too, when you went in. So also, I want to add that, I mean, you had, you know, like you said, incredible jobs. I mean, you were the fashion, um, what was it, fashion advertising? Yes, uh, for fashion and beauty advertising director at Vibe. 
And then I went to Rolling Stone where I was a senior fashion director um, of, of, of um, advertising. So these were really big, well-paying jobs. They were jobs that traditionally were held by men. Um, and, um, you know, I was excelling in my career. And literally, the, I think the point that you're about to talk about is like when I went into my boss's office and he said, what? Oh, he said, you're having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, I, and when I read that, I was like, you were 38. <laughs> you were not midlife anyway. But still, what a terrible excuse, you know, to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, at that time, that was in 2005. So we didn't have the term mansplaining. But typical example of mansplaining, right? Like the fact that he could. I mean, I, I had done so well in my career, right? So obviously I was intelligent, you know, um, I was very driven. Um, and so why would he think that a person with my acumen was like just on a chuck it all on like some kind of lofty idea, right. like, you know what I mean? So I just thought that that was like, so looking back, it's like insulting, but in the moment I didn't even care. Yeah, well, you, yeah. Care. And you sounded, it sounded just exhausted. I mean, it started the, the, and it comes out, you know, in your book. So buy the book, everybody, but you know, where you were just, you were at a point of exhaustion in Milan. I mean, and, and, you know, it sounds like you were like something I've never done, you know, go, you know, front row on these fashion, uh, luxury fashion places. And then, you know, front row, first class luxury hotel, and you're exhausted you know, and, and you knew, and you had planned this. It wasn't like you just walked in. You had it in your own mind when you were going to quit this job. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the mansplaining, <laughs> oh my goodness, was like, oh yeah, <laughs> when I read that. But you also, um, it, with, throughout the book, you have all these revelations that I have written down. You know, And I think I, when I requested to have you on our show, I told your assistant or in my email, I have been laughing out loud. Now the whole book is not laugh out loud, but the things you say and the way you say certain things are laugh out loud. So I even made a list of my laugh out loud okay. moments in your book, but um, I can get to those after the revelation part. But um, the, one, the one you said, um, I, I've written a bunch of them down though, but, um, you all, another thing I want to touch on is you described Little Brown Bevy. And that is so, you know, they say uh, girls really lose confidence after um, adolescence. So do you, is that kind of where you felt like you lost touch with Little Brown Bevy? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was junior high school, so I guess 11 years old. Um, you know, I had had like a very idyllic um, childhood up until then. You know, I was, um, you know, born and raised in Harlem. Um, but a lovely two parent household, um, you know, I was the baby, my sister's a year older, my brother's 11 years older than I am. So came from a very small, but loving and tight knit family. We always did family outings, you know, we were always doing things. And so I felt very loved, nurtured, and most importantly, protected. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I go to junior high school, um, that's when, and everyone knows this, that's when the clicks start, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when the mean girls start showing up. Yeah. And as soon as I got there, I had a mean girl experience and I decided then that I didn't want to be bullied anymore. And I was going to suppress my sunshiny little uh, sweet. I like to skip around the neighborhood self and I was going to become a cool girl. Mm -hmm. And in my community, if, if you were cute, dressed well, knew how to dance and had a quick wit, you could become a popular girl. And I said, okay, I think I can do all those things. Yeah. And that was a goal. Mm -hmm. But then I, I suppressed a part of me that was the nerdy bookish girl who loved to read, you know, who loved to sit on the sofa with her sister and, and read liner notes of albums while uh, my mom was like, you know, cooking and, you know, just like the little yeah. tiny yeah. Sweet little touches mm -hmm. of a childhood that we now wish we could all get back, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Get back to those sweet moments. But you know, um, at that at that time, I was like, oh no, this is not cool. Me being like um, a mama's girl, a, a daddy's girl, being up underneath my family like that. And I, I kind of learned how to become cool. Um, and I lost my, my little brown baby self and she did not show back up. 
until mm-hmm. I was 38 years old. Mm-hmm. So she was missing in action for 27 years. That's a long time. And you know, p- pieces of her would show up every now and again. Yeah. But she really came back roaring and was like, you need me. She was very right. Yeah. And I think you put that into words so well, because I think a lot of women go through that. I mean, I know I did. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember. That's about the time I started to be really self-conscious and, you know, and like you said, suppress. And I thought she just put into words <laughs> what women go through. And then you get to a point in your life, you're like, I need to find that person again. I need to get that confidence back again. So I just love how you describe that. And you also bring in parts of, you know, what you called. Um, All oh, my other personas, right? Yes, your other personas. Was it, was it yeah. I forgot the words. Big, was it? Um, um, well, there's, um, there's um, MC Bevsky because I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised in New York City. And so that's where hip hop was birthed. So of course I thought I fancied myself a rapper. Um, and then there was um, a big bet from Uptown. She's that's- the party girl. Yeah. She is the, the hot chick in the game. She mm-hmm. is going to all the A-list um, hip hop parties. She's partying with Puff Daddy and, um, um, you know, uh, Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac yeah. and all the big folks from the 90s hip hop scene. Um, and at the same time, she's juggling a career in, in, in fashion advertising. Wow. But the two never meet. No yeah. one in the fashion advertising world know that I have this huge hip hop lifestyle and no one in the hip hop lifestyle know that I have this big advertising career. So that was Big Bet from Uptown. And then we move into Beverly Smith, fashion <laughs> executive. So think about the caricature that you see on Devil Wears Prada, Miranda Priestly. So yeah. it's, I'm in dripping in all the designer clothes and I'm like flying to Milan, Paris and London for work. And I'm sitting front row at the fashion shows and I have a car and driver. You know, my, my driver Giovanni picks me up from the Mount Pinsa <laughs> airport in Milan, you know, six times a year. And, you know, I go into my fabulous hotel suite. There's a corner suite, it's Buttercup Yellow, you know, uh, <laughs> tapestries and, and gifts from all the fashion designers. So that I go into that space, Beverly Smith, fashion executive. And that's when I really begin to realize how unhappy I am because I am living this life that does not really feel good. Um, at a time, for a time, it did, I, I was able to convince myself it's what I wanted because it, it was what I always wanted. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, you know, and I think so many women can agree with this. Sometimes the things that we think that we want that are going to make us happy. And then when we finally get it, we're like, well, that didn't work. Yeah, and yeah. I, tell you, I was shocked when it didn't work. I could not believe that I have worked all these years since I was 18 years old and I finally get to it. And I'm like, I'm not happy. What? <laughs> yeah, like, what happened? Happy? And so it wasn't an easy decision that I had to make, you know what I mean? And, and honestly, I didn't make a de- the decision to change my life. Well, I made the decision to change my life right then and there. I had no idea how I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And it literally took, I was 33 years old when I had that meltdown in Milan. And I was not, I was 38 when I quit Rolling Stone magazine. So it took five years of excavating and digging deep and finding out the things that would really make me happy and the things I was passionate about and the things that I should really be pursuing in my life versus just a check and being fabulous. Right. Those things were not the key to my happiness. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, there are just so many things that you say in there. Um, I, and I know that when you decided, when you finally, well, you decided to leave Vibe and you went in, you got an offer and you went in to counter, they didn't counter offer. And that was one of my laugh out loud, your, your response. And I'm trying to write because I wrote it down oh. in the pages. Oh yeah. When they didn't, you said you were Petty LaBelle, Tom Petty and uh, the Heartbreakers and you live at Petticoat Junction. And I just like died laughing because I was like, yeah, I know. You know, yeah, the- I, felt, I was Petty, you know, I was like bitter that I went to Vibe Magazine. I didn't want to leave the magazine. But you know, one of the other revelations, everything is as it should be. Because had they countered, had they given me a counter order offer, I would have never gone to Rolling Stone. If I don't go to Rolling Stone, I don't think I quit fashion advertising at 38. I think Vibe was such a home. Mm -hmm. Vibe magazine was the first place where my culture and my profession 
ever merge. Mm -hmm. And so it was a wonderful experience working there. And I felt very loved, cared for, and protected, which mm -hmm. I think is what, you know, a through line for what all of us want, right? Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs, right? Mm -hmm. So we want, and, and I felt seen in that space. So if they had countered, which literally, as you read the book, the things that I wanted them to give me, the position I wanted them to give me, is still, <laughs> it's still mediocre compared to what I really wanted for myself. Mm -hmm. But even back then, I was too afraid to even just say it. Right. So if they had given me that counter offer, I would have stayed there and I would have still been miserable. Mm -hmm. So everything is as it should be. And I know we don't like to get into religion, but I do, I have a very strong faith. And mm -hmm. I do believe that God mm -hmm. placed me in that mm -hmm. position so that I would be free yeah. and I would have the courage and the confidence to quit that big paying job. Because when I got the Rolling Stone, I was miserable and uh -huh. no one wants to stay in a miserable space. Uh -huh. So it was like, yeah, I know I said I have to quit this job and, and guess what? I'm happy to do it. They're going to give me this bonus check and I'm going to be out of here, you know? Yeah. But if I had been someplace where I was happy, I probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah. So, you know, there's, um, there's a really great saying, a man's rejection is God's protection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is some way to, that is the way to look at it too. And I mean, I love that you did that. And then you knew you were like, head down, I've got to get this bonus and then I'm getting out of here and, yeah. and stuck with it. But then, you know, like you said, you were like, okay, this is what I want to do. What am I going to do now? And, you know, I know that you, uh, or, uh, or whatever you say that you were like, gee, I wish I'd planned better financially, but I'm kind of like that trip to Africa sounds like maybe you still needed that. <laughs> I definitely needed it, but I probably didn't need to stay at the same hotel that Nelson Mandela stays at. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. I'm still like in that mindset of me being a corporate executive and having this really great salary coming in. And I didn't really realize that, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this trip because, you know, I did my own, my sepia version of Eat, Pray, Love, where I went to Brazil, I went to Costa Rica, and I went to South Africa, and then I went to Zambia. Um, and, you know, when you're traveling like that, and I travel nice, it's very expensive. Like, I'm not a backpacker, hostile kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So I like to stay nice, and I like to fly nice. So these are very expensive trips. Um, and so I probably would have maybe downgraded <laughs> On, on my travel, you know, if I had known that I was going to go broke in the interim. Um, but, you know, the, the good thing about going broke, too, and, and this is something that I want, because uh, I know there are a lot of people that are watching and listening to us that are going through financial difficulties be, due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So many of us have had to pivot and to really kind of reimagine our lives because the loss of income, loss of loved ones, you know, this is a very, very tough time for all of us. It's a trying time. But what I will tell you is this, you know, financial struggles, you know, um, are very daunting, obviously. But I will ask you to really pray, not for money, but for clarity mm -hmm. to see your way out of your financial struggles. Mm -hmm. Pray for the clarity of mind. Yes. Because that's what I would always pray for that because I, 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 I don't know, but for me, I don't like to pray for material things. Like mm -hmm. I, but I will ask God for the clarity to see my way through something so that I can get to a space where I can make money and be financially comfortable and things like that. And so I would pray to God for that. Mm -hmm. And God answered because God gave me the idea for my business dinner with Betty. Oh, those and were so fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> that made me an accidental entrepreneur and it was, it was wonderful. And it was, you know, my business tier, um, pairs up celebrities with big fashion companies and other, uh, you know, big brands, corporate brands. Um, and because of that, I was able to have all these great relationships with celebrities from Kerry Washington to Idris Elba, you know, just a bunch of folks. Mm -hmm. Um, and now of course, these are the same people that I get to interview on my radio show, on my TV shows that I do and different things like that. So again, everything is as it should be, because if I don't go broke, then I don't create dinner with Bevy. If I don't create dinner with Bevy, I don't have relationships with celebrities. If I don't have relationships with celebrities, 
then I don't get to interview all these folks and have the career that I have now. So isn't it, that something? It, it, the way it happened too, the the spark that that happened. Um, do you mind sharing how that that story, how that all oh, happened? Yeah. Yeah, I was I was broke. I had just realized I was broke, right? So I I know this doesn't sound so ridiculous, but you know I had um, been squirreling away money in different accounts and things like that. And you know I was like, okay, oh yeah, I have to take a trip to LA because I'm trying to meet with a casting agent. So I'm going to go into that account, take some money out. So by the time I I I, I get around to um, maybe two years into the journey, I realize there's no more bank accounts to tap into, and I'm like, I'm tapped out. And um, I'm invited to a fabulous dinner party that Hugo Boss is throwing at this very fancy restaurant called Nobu in New York City with $25 lychee martinis, you know, um, an entree is probably about 75 bucks, you know, and that's on the low end of it. So basically it's a kind of place where you're easily going to spend 250 bucks for one person, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to this dinner party. Now remember I'm broke. So there's no way in the world I can take myself to this fancy place but it's one of my favorite places. So of course I go. And because I worked in fashion, I still have all my fancy outfits. I don't have any money. <laughs> like I have all my fancy outfits. So I pull on one of my fancy garments, you know, pull on my fur and I pull on my high heels and I strut in there and I have the best time. And what I realized when I get there is that I'm the only person there that has no job. Mm -hmm. And I have no affiliation with a magazine, with a fashion house, none of it. And what I realized at that moment was, OMG, I have real relationships in this space. People like me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I wasn't Beverly from Vibe or Bevy from Rolling Stone. People actually bought into me. Mm -hmm. And that was a beautiful feeling to, to realize that. So then I was leaving, I was a little tipsy. I see a young R&B star named Amarion and I say, oh my gosh, you should have been at this dinner. It was GQ and Esquire and Hugo Boss and all this. And I realized there's no way for this young man to get into a, a dinner party like that unless I bring him. Mm -hmm. And that's when I come up with the idea. For wow. dinner. I, that was so, I was like, wow, because that's just like such an original idea, original thing to bring up. And, and then you went for it. And you had your relationships with your friends that you, you it seems like you kept great relationships with different people where you worked and you were able to get your friend to help yeah well mm -hmm. it's all about relationships right so i know people often talk about networking i don't believe in networking i don't like networking mm -hmm. i think it's predatory what mm -hmm. i love is actually establishing real connections and relationships with people mm -hmm. because then it's not a thing of like you know um for my book launch my my book launch was at bloomingdale's Mm -hmm. And Titus Burgess from the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt w was the host. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm having a book launch at Bloomingdale's, the flagship store on 59th Street. Because 20 years prior, I went into a, a conference room and had a meeting with a young man who was a fashion director at the time at Bloomingdale's. And he's now one of the top executives at Bloomingdale's. And so when he finds out about my book, he says, how can we help? Gosh, yeah. But if I had been a predatory person, if I had not cared about him as a human and only saw him as like a potential client, someone I could get money from. And by the way, he never advertised with me. Wow. But I liked him and he liked me. So it went beyond the business transaction. Mm -hmm. that, and that then is... it pays off. You understand? Like yeah. the, the beauty of that. So being authentic in my book, I talk about authenticity. I talk about integrity. You know, um, one of my favorite chapters is the red soul proposition. Yes, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, I mean, how you said uh, you talked about the Milano Bl Blonix for the shoe, but yes. you can go ahead and share that and share the red soul. Yeah. yeah. So there's a shoe, Christian Louboutin, and it's a very expensive shoe. I, I, at this point, I think probably the cheapest Christian Louboutin shoe that you can receive, that you can buy is probably maybe 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and they go up to thousands of dollars. That's thousands with a plural S. Um, and uh, once upon a time, there was a shoe called Manola Blonic. It, it still exists. It's a shoe that Carrie from Sex and the City was obsessed with. Remember when they found out that she had $40,000 worth of shoes and she had no money for a down payment yes. in her apartment? Well, it was Manola Blonic that she spent all her money on. 
or they were the shoe of the of the fashion and eat of the socialites of uh, everyone. Everyone needed a Manolo Bromic in their life, and then Christian Louboutin comes along, and they're able to usurp Manolo Bromic space in the fashion world and in the shoe game. It's like insane, and then pop culture mm-hmm. because the, the Sex and the City movie, the first one, um, they actually are wearing. Not Manola Blonix, they were in Christian Louboutin. <laughs> so even still, you know what I mean? So what's the difference between a Manola Blonix and a Christian Louboutin? Well, the big difference is Christian Louboutin has a red soul. So in my book, I ask you guys to figure out what your red soul is. And the way we're going to do that is you're going to tell me who you are at your core. How are you being perceived? How would you like to be perceived? If you answer those questions honestly and really put some time into them, that's how you'll begin to build what your personal brand is about. What's your red soul? Yes. So my red soul is authenticity. Is that I can go anywhere in the world, be exactly show up the exact same way all the time. As far as like who I am, what I believe in. I don't censor myself for people. Um, I don't put on airs. Um, I'm going to be the same way. I am at a Harlem block party as I am at, and when I'm in Mykonos at an elite beach club, it's going to be the same Beverly. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the same Beverly. Yeah. And, and so that's a big part of the way I make my money now. So when you see, see me on TV, the reason why the book is called Revelations Lessons from a Mother Auntie Bestie, mother comes from the fact that the young gay um, men that I worked with um, when I was on Bravo's Fashion Queens, they started calling me mother. And so now everywhere I go, if I'm in the LGBTQIA space, they refer to me as mother. I love that. (laughs) Yes. The auntie comes from the young women that watch me on TV and think, oh, she's the cool auntie. She's the rich auntie. You know, oh, I I wish I had an auntie like that because I still have that youthful, uh, you know, kind of exuberance. And of course, everyone knows the auntie is the one who you can talk to when you can't talk to your mom. So that's how they think of me, the young women that watch me on TV. And I'm talking about women that are under the age of like 35, 40. Yeah, yeah. And then when we're getting into our space, the bestie comes in from all the women that have watched me over the years and think, wow, I wish I could do what Bevy has done. I would love to have dinner with her. I would love to have a cocktail with her. I would love to go on one of those fabulous trips that she's always taking. Mm -hmm. That's the bestie part of it. And so those are the connectivity moments. So even in the book, even on TV, what what my my red soul proposition is is the ability to connect with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and the book that was I loved the whole example of it all. It was like it was just like the way you explain it. It's like okay, I can get this, and and it it is it's such a self a self help book that makes you laugh too, (laughs) you know, you know, not every, not everything in it's funny, but just the way you present it. And I suggest people, I listened to it and I bought the book because I like to go back and refer to it. So I listened and I was like, what did she say there? (laughs) And then I go, (laughs) and that's why I I wrote down all these bevelations too. And I mean, I was trying to see, like, that was one of them that I wrote down, um, your, your mentors in your life. And you said a true mentor sets you up to win with or without them. And that was kind of like your first job in advertising, really. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and was it Jeff, is it Jeff McKay? Is that Jeff the name? McKay. Yes. Wait, the, Jeff McKay and Kenny Valenti and Chuck Cohen and Gail Malloy. And the thing that I want everyone to take note of is that none of those people are African-American. None of them have a shared experience, cultural experience but they saw me and they understood who I was and they appreciated me and they mentored me in the best way. They didn't mentor me like in a white savior kind of way. They didn't mentor me thinking that I was a downtrodden young black girl from Harlem. We have to save her. They didn't mentor me with the idea that I would always be beholden to them. They mentored me in a beautiful and caring and nurturing way. And um, it was really, um, it was really just such a great experience. Um, and to this day, um, now, of course, I'm 54 years old and um, I still count them as dear friends. I'm still 
you know, having relation, you know, I still have a relationship with each and every one of them. So again, goes back to that connectivity, right? That relationship, that authenticity. Yeah. And, and that, and that's so important. It was another, and he was a startup and that was another one of yours work for a startup. Yeah. Uh, work for a startup. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cause you're on the ground floor and you see the way everything operates. And so when you go out into the world and you're your own entrepreneur, you'll understand, you know, um, some of the tools that you need and, and you will understand some of the strategies that you have to take on. You know, it's great to work at big companies because obviously I went on to work at Rolling Stone. Um, but working at a startup gave me so much information. And then, of course, I applied that information when I started dinner with Betty. But I went to NYU. Oh. Um, I say in the book, I say, um, I, I rushed through it because I'm like, that's a big chunk um, in which we really didn't have time to go into in the book. Um, but I say, um, that's a part of my life where I had a failed, a, that was a time when I didn't complete things. Like I didn't get married to my fiance and I didn't graduate from college. Um, but the important part about that is because I do believe that college is very important um, because I know that, you know, oftentimes you can't even get a, a, a starting position mm -hmm. in the corporation without a college degree. Um, so I never want to say you don't need college. Okay. And I yeah. think that we need to find a different way in which people can have college finance because, like you said, people are coming out with huge debt and everything. And especially at a school like NYU, an incredibly expensive school. Um, but you know, um, you know, I often say um, it's one thing to uh, drop out of a school like an NYU or some Ivy League school, and another thing to drop out of like a, you know a subpar school people look at that because mm. you know you need a certain amount of intelligence to even get into these kind of schools right. and so that kind of being able to even say that i attended nyu when i got to vibe that that, that did open doors right mm, okay um it did open doors um when i got to rolling stone it was so funny when they um i went i went and met with hr and they were like oh you know bevy um you didn't put down your the 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 the, the um the date that you graduated. I said, oh well, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh well, Bevy, you know this job requires a college degree. I said, really? I said, well, here's what you should do. You should call the publisher and explain to him that Bevy Smith does not have a college degree. And and she said, well, no. I mean, you know, honestly, this job you have to have a college degree. I said, well, if you call the publisher. I think he might have something different to say. So of course she calls him and he's like, what are you talking about? She's a, a she's an icon in the business. She's 38 years old, played at the highest rung of this business. Clearly she knows what she's doing. A degree, it doesn't make a difference. So yeah, at that point and at this point, no, the degree doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. But if I had not been mentored and, and cared for mm -hmm. and supported by Jeff McKay in the early part of my career. You wouldn't have had those doors. Yeah. I would have all those doors closed. Mm, okay. I know right now though, for a lot of young people, it has been, they, they, I don't know. I have a niece that's going through some things right now, you know, and, and I know that, that it's been tough. She chose not to go. Um, and I know it's been really tough for her. And yeah. I was like, I'm going to have to get her, I'm going to send her this book because I just, because yeah. I think she's feeling extremely down. She's feeling, you know, uh, just, I, she lost a job. Things are tight. Finances are tight. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I think she needs to hear this. So she needs to hear this and she needs a book. Please. And, and, and please have a focus on the part where we take what we have in our hands. So mm -hmm. I'll just give you some prime examples and I talk about it in the book. These wonderful people that have done different things. So when you look at the cover of my book, mm -hmm. that is shot by a dear friend of mine who is a music industry executive mm -hmm. who, who at the age of 40 decided he wanted to become a photographer. He has been taking photography classes. And he's taken, a, there's a picture right over my shoulder with me with kissy face. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he took that. So he's been taking all these great photos. And when it came time for me to shoot my book cover, I said, you know what? I want to give him an opportunity to shoot this book cover. And so now he's been on a billboard. He's been in Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Over 10,000 people have bought this book. 
Yeah. And his his art, his work is is now is up there. And you you pulled somebody, yeah, you mentored someone else. So I mean, it's just it's like paying it forward, but not yeah. expecting right. anything in return. Yeah. Yes. And but it's also about, you know, it's your niece you were talking about, yes? Yes. yes. My sister is a home cook. She loves to cook. Well, she just started a catering business, Miss Lolly's Kitchen, named after my mom. Okay. And she's been doing these amazing cakes where she um, bakes, bakes them wholesale and, and sells them to restaurants. Um, she's been doing a few, um, I have a lot of fancy friends. So mm -hmm. a lot of fancy people don't like to cook a turkey for Thanksgiving. She had a, a bunch of Thanksgiving orders for turkeys and for Christmas and different things like that. She's about to do a whole Mother's Day marketing campaign. But this is a woman who is a mother of five kids, a, a housewife, and now she's creating this own, her own business with what she has in her hand. Mm -hmm. I also mentioned um, a young woman out of New Orleans. Um, her nickname is Super Saint, and she has a makeup company that she built. She used to clean hotel rooms in the, the French Quarter, mm -hmm. and she used to be a waitress in the French Quarter, and now she has a multi-million dollar cosmetic company called crayon case oh, wow. <laughs> so we take what's at our hands we take the things that we are passionate about so mm -hmm. i i would urge your niece to really figure out what it is that makes her happy that she mm -hmm. what she loves doing and find a way to start making even if it's a small amount of money mm -hmm. doing what she loves right right that will take you that will take you where you want to go. In your book, where you said you shopped your closet and you sold your purse. And yes. I gave her a pair of Louboutins once that were too small for me. Yeah. And I had actually bought them on consignment. And then I, they were too small. I gave them to her. And I was like, you know what? Go sell those Louboutins. They were a gift for me. Yes. Go sell them. <laughs> Baby, because I've read sold this work a lot. But I, I just am like, this book is so good you know for all of that you know and i just i i just feel like it's just so helpful for everybody and and like you said earlier women our age you know we get to that point where we're just thinking okay or either you're pushed out of a job you might be forced out of it or like yes. where they're they want the younger people or something and you're forced they want they want to pay them less yes they don't there's want all the experience things. but i just think everything about this was so great. Yes. Oh, the Mr. The Mr. Right, looking for Mr. Right, but settling for Mr. Right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was another one. And like you said, you don't have to have a man in your life. Now, I know you love men. I love men. <laughs> and, I'm, I'm, and I'm actively pursuing a big monumental relationship. Oh, and yeah. So I'm on this tour and I'm talking about wanting to be and a big, monumental, huge, loving relationship. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this, my life right now is cake. Uh, my man will be icing. <laughs> cake by itself is very tasty. <laughs> He's just gonna make it a little sweeter. Yes, I love that, I love mm -hmm. it. But you know, uh, um, we were talking to another lady, uh, it was Mindy Cohn, and she said the same thing. She's about our age, and she said- yeah, I love Mindy, she's a dear friend. Oh, oh, she was so sweet, and, and she just said the same thing as you. Just like, yeah, you know, it's, you guys just have, you know, you have this time, and um, if it works out, it's great. But I love to the example that it well, sets. It's gonna work out. It's gonna work yeah, out. It's gonna, it's gonna work out. Now, the way I put this work and manifested this, this life that I have, my life, I'm not closing my eyes without experiencing this oh, kind of love. Yeah. I will not. I yeah. refuse to believe it for a minute. So yeah. it's going to manifest that. A That's great awesome. Love. Well, I mean, you've uh, all of these other things have happened in your life. And and you've talked about also, I've just got some of these funny moments in the book. When, when uh, Jeff McKay invited everybody out to Connecticut, um, but you had the adventure the great adventures of theme park yes ride and <laughs> yeah and yeah you, you missed out you felt like you missed out yeah, and sure. you need to be in the room where it happens you and need you need to be in the room where it happens yeah. i had no idea the difference between a job and a career you know i don't know how you were raised but for me everyone that i knew worked really hard and they had jobs mm -hmm. a career 
uh, you know, a job, you can get off work when the, you know, if you're nine to five at ha five o'clock, you leave it right there and you go on about your business. A career, you're thinking about constantly, you're always doing work on it, you know, that kind of thing. And I didn't know, I had no idea. And then I, I learned that day though. And I yeah. never let that happen again. You said you put down the, uh, Put down the corn dog and pick up the croquet mallet. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh my goodness. And and you also do uh, public speaking uh, mm -hmm. with, with different business groups. Yeah. And, oh, you did the tour with the historically mm -hmm. black colleges and universities. Did you come to Fisk or in Nashville? Fisk. I didn't come to Fisk. Oh, okay. But, um, yeah, but of course, Fisk is one of the, the very famous ones. Yeah. But that was a great tour. That was the first time I ever was a public speaker. And it really, um, it was really great. And it really did change the trajectory of the way I communicate when I'm speaking with people. And it really helped um, shape up the framework for this book as well. Right. That authenticity is where I really realized that on that tour, because I was there with so many other professional speakers and they all had just very fabulous stories of success. Um, and there was nothing, uh, I, you know, people often will tell you A to Z, but they never talk about that middle part. And so in this book, the book, the blissful chapter is the middle part. That's the gritty part. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want people to think that changing your life is easy. You know, deciding to pivot is easy. It's not. Mm -hmm. But then again, leading a mediocre life that you really can't stand, it ain't easy at all. Right. And that's the thing that'll kill you. Yeah. That, misery, that yeah. malaise, that depression will take you down. So, you know, I felt it was important to talk about the tough times in my journey. Um, and it's great. Now I've made it. Woohoo! Yeah. There were years. It took seven years from Rolling Stone to get Bravo's Fashion Queens. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and I met Andy Cohen two years, a year or so into my journey, you know, and when he was just a TV executive and he offered me, I mean, you know, I went in, I uh, auditioned for the Tim Gunn show and I got the gig. And then when the contract came over, it was a bad deal. And mm -hmm. so I couldn't take it. But from there, Andy said, I want to meet with you. And I met with him and his boss. And he said, we're going to work together. And for seven years, he tried to find a project for us to work together. And it took seven years. Wow. But you know that. I that's the number of completion. Yeah, it's so in that book, in your book too, the whole Tim Gunn show, you know, you think you get this and then they just want it so much, you know, from the contract and that was going to interfere with your dinner with Bevy mm -hmm. and you had your friends, you had your relationships to fall back on and say, could you look at this for me and make sure that this is okay? Mm -hmm. And that, that is so important, you know, just the perseverance, like, I, I, okay, yeah, that money might look good, but this is gonna well, the money didn't even look good. That was oh, that's too. right. You <laughs> said the money wasn't that great. Yeah, that I'd be on the side of the bus riding the bus. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and you know that's a misconception. I think a lot of people have that if you are on TV, no matter what you are on, they think that you are a multimillionaire. And I, and I've I've just now learned. You know, now in my fifties. Oh, oh, okay. That's not necessarily the truth. Okay. No. <laughs> but when you get into it, you start to make money, you know, like, so by the time I got to page six TV, that's a, a good paying job. You right. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not the work that I do, you know, if I'm, if I give a speech, it's a five figure fee, yeah. you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But you have to work up to that. Yes. It doesn't happen. You don't just show up and say, I'm a public speaker. <laughs> I demand, you know, $20,000 and they give it to you. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But but if I had never, ever dared to dream, which is another mm -hmm. chapter in the book, I would not have these amazing experiences that allow me, you know, my daddy, I don't, we don't even have much time, so I'm only getting to my dad, but my dad died of COVID in April, as you know. From yes. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. And, but he, um, he was 95 when he passed away and he, his health has started declining in his early 90s, like maybe around 92. Last three years of his life, he was like getting sick of my daddy would always say, I'm going down slow. And he was, he was going down slow and then COVID took him out. But um, he, um, I was able to spend good time with my parents mm -hmm. because I had this freedom, because mm -hmm. I had this new life. I didn't have a nine to five. 
Right. So I was able to, you know, say, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do that because I'm going to go and spend time with my parents. Yeah. You know, I, and I was making good, I'm making good money. Not good, but we continue right. to make good money. I'm making good money. So I was able to supplement what uh, my dad's health insurance couldn't cover for his home health attendant. You know, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it takes time to build up that kind of uh, kind of equity. In the yeah. Where yeah. People really have to pay you. That's right. And thank I want to thank you. And, and I want to tell everybody too that last bit of your book about your dad, the questions to your dad. Oh, that was so touching and sweet and just everything about that. Everybody, you've got to read that. And I want to thank you again so much. And you have a website as well. Yes, uh, Wait, I want to show the folks. Wait, now I have to, I'm going to be honest. Now, remember the last chapter of the book. You remember the title? Oh, I've got to grab it. I don't anyway, know. I'm going to read it to you. Don't worry. Okay. About I'm going to tell you the last chapter of the book because it's, it's very, a pandemic, race relations, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and not wearing bottoms during Zoom calls. 2020 in a nutshell. I'm not wearing any bottoms right now. So hold on. <laughs> I love hold on. that part. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. <laughs> I'll have to see. That was so Okay. So on my website, bevysmith.com, we've got mugs. And remember you said you're writing things down? We've yes. got the Revelations Journal. Yeah. We've got Bevelations tote bags. We've got the whole schmata. So yeah. Yeah. Please, yeah. please, please go to bevysmith.com. It'll also tell you all the places where I'll be doing um this will be listed as one of the places where you can come yeah. and listen to an interview with me, all my appearances, and then all my Bevelations merch. Right. Yes, guys, you have to look at it. You have to go there and check out your your radio show, uh radio Revelations on Sirius XM. Radio yeah. Andy is Andy Cohen's network. And so, um, yeah, it's a really fun show. We interview today. I um, interviewed Soleil Moon Fry from Punky yeah. Booster and Tia Maui from Sister Sister. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was one of the last people to interview Cicely Tyson. Um, I interviewed her on a Monday. She passed away on a Thursday. Um, so I have all kinds of great celebrity interviews. It's really cool. Oh. Well, I appreciate so much you taking your time to talk to me and just appreciate your book. So everybody, you've got to read this book and do what I do, you know, <laughs> audio book and buy the book to go back and reference. So. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, my love.